Yeah, it's great to be back. Today we are going to be chatting about um, a really interesting subject, uh, DMTX. Really excited to get into it with you because this is something you you kind of clued us into a few months ago, and you even invited me down to do some live stream in Boulder around your kind of launch of the idea. Um, so, can you give us just a really quick picture of what what DMTX is? Sure. Yeah. Uh, DMTX, that's like the shorthand, uh, how we type it, um, and share it in, uh, kind of unofficial ways. Uh, the, the official term is extended state DM. Um, and, uh, it was a model proposed by Dr. Andrew Gallimore and Dr. Rick Strassman to create an extended state uh, dimethyl tryptamine experience. Uh, one of the biggest complaints around uh, DMT, like pure DMT experiences, as opposed to uh, DMT and ayahuasca, is that it's very short acting, uh, either if you inject it intravenously or uh, like what Rick Strassman did in the original uh, spirit molecule studies, or if you smoke it, uh, that the peak only lasts five to seven minutes. Uh, and so it can be a very big experience, but uh, sometimes very confusing given the short duration and, and intensity. And so the DMT, uh, extended state DMT research proposal that Dr. Gallimore uh, wrote about and that we are looking to step into is to use a, a target controlled intravenous infusion technology it's this little uh, medical pump that's used in anesthesiology and also in like chemotherapies and uh, other treatments, even ketamine treatments. Uh, it's um, to make a, an extended state stable over a period of time. Uh, so it can be up, up, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? It can be intensified. It can be a low dose MD, uh, DMA, DMT experience. Uh, um, but for longer than the five to seven minute peak. Um, so you can have uh, a low dose type experience for an extended period of time or a full peak experience for an extended period of time. And so we're, we're wanting to step into this research to explore what the limits are of the consciousness uh, movement and what we can learn from that experience. Um, one of the nobody, things I like about it is nobody's ever done it before. <laughs> it's really interesting because there's so much to study there. Um, that just opens up like a lot of subjective stuff, a lot of quantitative stuff. Uh, we can do some really interesting uh, brain imaging. I think, I don't know if you saw this, I, I sent you the, the message um, yesterday on this yeah that um mm. whose lab was that was that carhart harris um did the yeah first, the london imperial school yeah um, so like the first brain imaging with dmt which is super cool i, I would love to know the route of administration um, uh -huh. or a little bit more data there uh -huh. guessing it's probably iv yeah they're looking at the extended state stuff but i don't think they're stepping into it for these um for these research uh, uh projects that they've got going on right now Right. Like they seem explicitly focused on brain imaging. Yeah. Um, which is cool. We need that. Um, but yeah, the, the way you and your team are going about it is interesting because it's, um, how best to put it? It's for, it's for the psychedelic community who's really interested in this work in a lot of ways. Like what does this stuff mean? What do the limits look like? Like if we get to go mm -hmm. beyond what Strauss, Strassman did, what happens? In a yeah. What are the ways? edges? Yeah. yeah, what are the things we can explore? Yeah, so, uh, you know, I really uh, support the, the movement and in, 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 uh, legalization of psychedelics and how people and researchers are bringing uh, psychedelics into the mainstream. Um, but what I find is that some of the interests or values of the psychedelic community uh, get undervalued in those conversations either because the mainstream doesn't have the context to discuss it and understand it, or it sounds too unusual or weird for it to be uh, accepted by the mainstream. There's also this need to be uh, 
uh, proven, you know, or useful. Psychedelics is useful. So psychedelics for the treatment of uh, PTSD or depression, right? And that's, I mean, there's a huge movement in these areas right now. Uh, but I was curious of what, what kind of research project would um, inspire the psychedelic community? The, what would the psychedelic community be most interested in if we weren't always trying to heal something or uh, resolve some trauma um, or try to fit into being accepted by uh, civil society? You know, uh, what, what are our real interests and um, what would we really want to do? And to me, those questions are, well, it's to explore the unknown. It's to explore the edges. What, what things in the psychedelic movement uh, that we don't already know about? Like we know MDMA can help treat um, PTSD, right? Um, and we're, you know, we're going through the, the mechanisms to make it more accessible. To me, that's incredibly important. And I wouldn't be talking about DMT, extended state DMT research for the sake of exploring what it is if we didn't have those threads. But now that we do, I'm really curious to create a space and a voice for the psychedelic community. What are we really interested in? And, um, and DMT is a very important molecule for our community. It's, uh, you know, it has an incredible history uh, for, for our community. And, um, and Rick Strassman's work uh, with DMT in, in the 90s was what reignited the uh, whole psychedelic renaissance that we're in. And so from an energetic or a symbolic perspective, I kind of feel like this would, is like going back to that original flame and igniting it in a new way, you know, expanding it exponentially. Like what, what are the edges now in 2017 versus... 1990 or 1972 or you know even earlier you know so so i'm really uh curious about this um about this work so we haven't had the chance to get daniel gallimore or andrew gallimore on yet but his presentation before yours at the initial launch event was incredible because to me he put together this argument that that almost proved dmt entities to me like, you know, just laying out this theory, laying out this data that can be generated in labs, just studying complexity and system flows. And I, before you even got on stage, I'm going, okay, like there's, <laughs> there's a, this is a real argument that, that I haven't seen before that brings far more validity, I guess, in a lot of ways to DMT entities than, you know, even personal subjective stories. And I don't know how... He so he was one of the guys that initially proposed this in a stu in a paper, is that right? Yeah, he wrote a paper that was co-authored by Rick Strassman. Uh, it was using Rick Strassman's data. It's called a model for the application of target-controlled intravenous infusion for a prolonged immersive DMT psychedelic experience. <laughs> it's a mouthful. Um, another language, pretty much. Um, yeah, he proposed this idea of like, if he had more time to, you know, to orient to this inner space, uh, this DMT space, more than the five to seven minute peak experience, he can uh, comprehend the experience um, more and have a better understanding of the phenomenology of it. Uh, this, you know, these ideas of, you know, entity encounters. Uh, you know, understanding what's really going on. And, uh, and yeah, he does make a case for um, this idea that complexity doesn't stop at the human brain level, that there are even higher levels of complexity and intelligence that are far beyond what we understand. And, uh, and you know, the people who have DMT experiences, uh, Rick Strassman said to me recently that the, the, the thing that was most surprising in the research was that everybody said it felt more real than real. Um, so how do you wrap your, your understanding of reality when something feels more real than real? And it's so foreign to what we understand our um, concept of intelligence and uh, the universe to be, you know? Um, and, you know, I'm really curious about that. I, 
I, we would get a lot of flack if we were to try to create a, a experiment, you know, to try to prove the existence of entities and things. And I don't think that's necessary. Uh, but uh, one of the edges that we are going to speak of, name, and create a space for it, uh, is the possibility that the, this phenomenon might be real. Uh, and if that's the case, how would we frame the experiment differently than if we were a bunch of neuroscientists thinking it was all an inner um, neurological experience? Maybe there would be things that we would do differently to support the volunteers going into it. And maybe there's certain strategies that the volunteers could learn to feel safer in these encounters with other entities. Um, it's just reminding me of like maybe prepping like an astronaut to go into space. <laughs> it's like, all right, much different than, yeah, going under like an MRI machine. Yeah. Um, it's like yeah. trying to... <laughs> You're exactly right. It's not, yeah, we're not astronauts and we're psychonauts in this space, right? Um, but, but given the real potential uh, for an extremely profound but also intense or difficult experience, we would be training people to treat this as if it were a real journey, like an astronaut would going, you know, to the moon or Mars, you know, uh, that there might be some mindfulness practices uh, that people can uh, work on to develop. Um, and also, you know, like you need some physical endurance. This, this doesn't, we, I don't think having just healthy volunteers is the, um, is the right approach. So one of the edges that we want to kind of support and promote is that, yes, we want healthy volunteers, but from this foundation, we want the, um, the best of the best, you know, the most gifted psychonauts that we can find because that's what astronauts are you know like they're like astronauts are like highly intelligent incredibly athletic very creative human beings right uh we want that kind of level of uh um capacity so we can better you know best understand what's going on inside you know and, that, and to keep the person safe you know yeah have you ever chatted with kalindi ie I feel like he would be a candidate for this. <laughs> That's a great point. <laughs> yeah. 25 to 40 grams of mushrooms. And he, he says he's an explorer. Um, like he is really trying to explore what is out there in the, the cosmos or within yeah. the psyche. Yeah. Are you yeah, familiar we, with this guy? Uh, um, tell me. Kalindi, this person Kalindi Ayi out of Detroit. Um, yeah. Really into martial arts and martial psychedelics. Martial arts guy. Yeah. Yeah, um, yeah, I have heard of him, and and we wanted we've been wanting to get him to talk at a psychedelic shine, but we haven't had a chance to do that yet. But yeah, he's definitely on my radar. That's a really important. Yeah, so martial artist, right, would definitely be a, a, a prime candidate for this work. Um, people who have experience in indigenous settings, of course, we want to you know we don't want to create a, a a criteria that doesn't include um, you know. Uh, different cultures, you know, um, cause there's a lot of ways to develop these skill sets. Um, but one of them is focus, the ability to stay focused in these states. Right. And so a martial artist, uh, a long-term meditation practitioner, uh, these are the, these are one of the things that I'm learning. Like if you can't stay focused on what's going on, then it's just gonna, you're just gonna spiral in it. You're just gonna spin in it and go from like, like changing, uh, channel on cable television with like 300 channels you just keep popping through them too much you know so so that's one of the areas that we that we are going to really focus on is the ability to stay focused in inner states and this is something that we can assess i you know i see different capacities for this all the time in my work so so i guess let's let's give a little background for people who haven't heard from you before um, I bring your name up all the time and I'm, I'm kind of surprised people don't know it every time and bring it up. <laughs> oh, yeah, really? Uh, you don't know him uh, yet? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Right. So Daniel, you're in Boulder, Colorado. So we've met a handful of times. We get to hang out in Oakland as well. You run an organization called medicinal mindfulness, which is, it has a bunch of parts, including a psychedelic sitter school and you teach yeah. a breathwork method and you do a really, um, intense, um, psychedelic cannabis ceremony um, or event. I, I don't know how you phrase that, but people get a lot of experience 
in those states. And then, then they're more functional. Um, you do some skills training too, more functional mm -hmm. in other psychedelic work. Um, yeah, right. or more able to function in those states. I don't know the best way to put that. Um, yeah. <laughs> I don't, I don't yeah. necessarily like putting boundaries on psychedelic experiences like that, but it's, um, yeah, it's fascinating. You're doing a ton of work. You're working with a ton of people. You've even stopped, I think doing, um, one-on-one -on -one therapy with folks in a, in a licensed setting and you've kind of switched over to this full time. Is that right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, yeah. So we started medicinal mindfulness about five years ago and I've been facilitating what we call conscious cannabis circles for the last four years, pretty regularly. And that's my day job as I, you know, I'm a psychedelic facilitator. Um, I also coach people uh, on the side who are interested in being facilitators or using medicines more intentionally. So I do a lot of pre and post uh, preparation and integration coaching with people. Uh, and then we have the psychedelic sitter school program where we're teaching people how to hold space um, with cannabis, but all those skill sets are, um, you can translate into other medicines pretty easily. And for those of you who don't know about cannabis as a psychedelic, uh, you know, this is the, you know, we get this a lot that people don't believe we can do what we can do with psychedelic or with cannabis as a psychedelic. And I think we talked about it in the last one, so I won't go too far into uh, the conversation here. But um, a psychedelic cannabis experience is um, similar to either a psilocybin or MDMA experience or some combination of both, a uh, psilocybin-MDMA-like experience. So it can be very heart-opening. Uh, it may be very visual. It may, it may not be, but it can be very visual. Um, and it also, and, and MDMA can, or excuse me, uh, cannabis can mimic other medicines, particularly if you've had them before. So if you're a ayahuasca person, your, your cannabis experience might be very ayahuasca like, um, um, uh, I've had experiences with cannabis that are very DMT like, uh, and other people have too. So, you know, I'm not like, it's not just me. Uh, and then most recently, the cannabis experiences have been very mescaline-like, very peyote-like, which is interesting. Um, for the whole group or for you? Uh, for me and, and then some of the individual journeys that I'm doing. Like the way people describe them, I can kind of feel into what their experience is like. Um, so very heart opening, but very alert and present, sharper, like more, more present, more clear than normal. You know, uh, some of the, sometimes the medicine can do, um, interesting things like that. Um, but yeah, it's, I'm deeply inspired by working with cannabis and breath work. Uh, uh, and I, I work with a lot of people, um, multiple times a week. Now I'm working with people in cannabis spaces or breathwork spaces. And then we have the ongoing groups um, and working with a lot of trauma healing, tra a lot of trauma resolution. Uh, mm. um, uh, and, and, you know, most recently I did a journey for somebody who had a traumatic ayahuasca experience. Uh, I won't go into the details of it, but, you know, he came in unresourced and um, with a severe headache or something. And, and it, Pop, the ayahuasca popped him in a really negative space, um, like a lot of anxiety and panic attacks afterwards. And uh, he flew in and we did a cannabis session and we were able to complete whatever process that was for him. And he's in a much better space, you know, has, has completed whatever that was. So that's kind of a new thread is helping people complete other psychedelic experiences uh, with using cannabis. Um, so that's, you know, it's been really wonderful um, to do. How long is a, um, say, uh, that one-on-one -on -one session or that, that session you just talked about, how, how long was he in the thralls of the psychedelic experience with you? Uh, yeah, uh, normally I schedule four to six hours for a journey. And mm -hmm. then about, depending on the person, the uh, cannabis part of the experience is two to three hours long. Um, on average, about two and a half is about where people's capacities are to engage it. And so it's like a short version. It's not, it's not a less intense version. Sometimes it's a real powerful experience, but it's a shorter uh, psychedelic experience. So in between the DMT experience and, you know, the MDMA psilocybin experience. Um, 
And uh, yeah, they're, you know, the peak is pretty quick. Like you smoke it. We, we smoke, we don't use edibles or anything. And so the peak is pretty immediate and then it lasts as long as you want it to. You know? uh, just, you know, like maybe there's a break in the middle where the person smokes more. Mm. Um, I forget who I was talking to, but they told me they were high for like 14 hours. <laughs> I, forget. I don't know who it was. It's probably somebody who has a lot going on. Um, you know, cause obviously there's a normal half-life to this stuff. Um, yeah. That was maybe a pretty extreme. Yeah. Right. I mean, it was experience. Was it edibles or was it? Uh, smoked, smoked. Uh -huh. um, yeah. That would be an abnormal duration. That would be something that we would look at like for clinical stuff too. You know, yeah. if, um, you know, I think just with other psychedelic work, like you'll see even in, in our form of breath work, like holotropic style, somebody will only be breathing for, you know, X amount of time, but they're deeply in process for a ton of hours after. And mm -hmm. um, that's one of the risks I don't think a lot of folks see is like, okay, you might have to be strapped in here for a bunch more hours than you really thought. Um, and I, I've seen some ayahuasca facilitators able to hang out for a lot of mm -hmm. hours after working with folks, but mm -hmm. I don't know that that's common knowledge in the psychedelic world. I hope people pick that up. Yeah, there's a like a bell curve of uh, normal duration, you know, and in the middle there's, you know, everybody it's about eight hours for certain experiences or about six or with, with cannabis, it's about two, two hours and 15 minutes if done correctly. Um, but then other people, you know, some people who are like really heavy smokers might have a shorter Right. Med, you know, journey. And then others who are either new, you know, to smoking cannabis, um, might have a much longer journey or there might be like, like neurological tendencies to have longer experiences on less medicine. And that's something with other medicines you have to be really, uh, careful about because it could like somebody take a half a hit of acid and they could be, you know, incapacitated for days. And, um, and other people take a half a hit and they're, you know, they barely feel it. You know, so. <laughs> the first time I ever got high was brownie and it lasted 24 hours. It was terrifying. I was like texting friends. I'm like, how long is this last? For? Yeah. Right. Like, I don't know. Three hours, maybe max. And I'm like, I'm going on 24. Like what the hell's going on here? Um, yeah. That's why we don't use edibles. It's, 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 there's so many different physiological responses to it. Yeah. And there's this, this so, difference too, like there's the pharmacology, right? The individual's person, individual person's reaction to chemicals and how quickly they metabolize or like probably even secondary metabolites or whatever. And then there's the psychological, um, situation you're coming into the uh, experience with, like maybe you have some pretty extreme repressed stuff or you don't. <laughs> so it's like, you know, happy days or like, you know, you're reliving Vietnam over the course of eight hours, you know, something like that. Yeah. Um, so, yeah. so what's the interest looking like for this DMT X, uh, research? Oh, wow. Yeah. So, uh, when we first did our first presentation, um, after, uh, when we invited Dennis McKenna to speak down here, uh, and then uh, psychedelic science has happened, you know, so February, we first talked about the DMT work as an idea, and then psychedelic science has happened. And then an article came out in a local uh, paper called The Rooster, uh, which um, really promoted the idea, like scientists are building a DMT machine or something was the title. And that went viral. Uh, I think, you know, like 30, 40,000 people read it or something like that. Uh, and then, uh, and then through my organization and another organization, no, new anonics, new anonics, if I'm saying that right, mm. um, uh, there have been 800, over 800 people, uh, expressing interest in being a research volunteer. Um, and, and before we even have like really been recruiting volunteers, so to speak, I, I was interested in uh, exploring who was interested in this work, like what kind of person would be interested in extended state DMT. So, you know, I really engaged it and, and we, we've gotten all their info and contacts and we're going to keep everybody informed. Um, but right now, I mean, it's, it's, it's uh, unparalleled, I think, how much interest there is in excitement around the idea of extended state DMT. Um, 
So that's been fun and also a little overwhelming too. Uh, like we've, we're not able to respond to everybody now. And, and uh, we've started a DMT update newsletter. If anybody's interested, they can email us at dmtx at medicinalmindfulness.org uh, to get the uh, newsletter, to get signed up for the newsletter. And that's how we're responding now to um, inquiries and things, because a lot of people are asking the same questions. Um, so that's been fun to see who uh, who wants to show up for a research project like this. It's fascinating. Um, what does Strassman think about all this? Like when you've talked to him, he's a interesting character. <laughs> Strassman is incredibly inspiring to talk to. Like like he's I think just hanging out with him and talking with him. We invited him a couple of years ago to Psychedelic Shine, and that's when I really started to. Uh, get to know him. And, um, and then uh, I visited him a few times at his home in Gallup. Um, I've taken uh, Gaia TV to go t- interview him for their new series on psychedelics called Psychedelica. That, that'll be out in January or something like that. Uh, he's really deeply inspiring to talk to about this, uh, about DMT in general and his experiences. Um, you know, I asked him, did you know what you were getting into? Did you know what you were stepping into when you did DMT research or wanted to do that? And he's like, yeah, I had an idea, you know, um, as far as extended state DMT, he's excited about it, but it's not his passion to be a part of it. Um, you know, this is, you know, this has been his life for a long time and he's ready to pass the torch to other people. Um, but he's been an ally and somebody that I, uh, that I speak to and ask technical questions around the research. Um, but he's, 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 he's excited, but he's also hesitant. You know, he, um, you know, he's written a book called the spirit molecule and he's also written a book called DMT and the soul of prophecy. He really, you know, he has a big question in his head of whether or not this is, um, a real phenomenon or just something going on in a neurological way and and if it's if it is more than just neurological like do we want to mess with it it's kind of his his um take and um my response to that was well i think we're already messing with it i think you know people are using dmt in uncontained environments they're using it now at festivals and raves maybe we should better understand what's going on so we can better protect ourselves from it yeah yeah we need Um, to know what's happening if there's something paranormal going on, fine, but let's find out. Yeah, to me, it, the experiences are, uh, are are pretty profound and extreme in and of themselves, but it's not just the experience. It's almost the implications of the experience that are the more of the, the big question. Like, if this is real, like it sure felt real, then the implications of it are pretty extreme or really big. You know, it means we're living in a universe that is not just inhabited by other entities or beings, but is like immensely inhabited by other, <laughs> beings. you know, like it's not some <laughs> microbe on another planet in another solar system somewhere. Like we're, we're thick in the middle of something amazing. Yeah, all these other dimensions are just right there. We're just right there. Yeah. We don't have to build a billion dollar machine to access them. This is a, something that we all have the capacity to do. You know, I remember I saw the um, premiere at Cosm when Strassman uh, and was it uh, Schultz re- released DMT, the spirit molecule. And he was telling like the audience that, you know, he hasn't talked about it as a research in a while. Cause it was like, really intense to process all of it. Um, but I, so, you know, that was actually the first book that I read that got me into the psychedelic literature because I had this near death experience and experience with psilocybin. And I was just in the bookstore and saw near death experiences and the spirit molecule. I was like, I need to, I need to read this. Mm. So when I got to talk to him, I was like really excited. And he was just like, if you want to do this research, just stick to the physiological research. He's like, like science is not interested in these entities and these transpersonal experiences. Um, yeah. So yeah, it, it, yeah, for sure. He and you know he he was kind of undercover when he did all this. He's a you know he you know he did it as a psychiatrist interested in uh, the effects of a drug, and he got um, 
funding by the National Institute of Drug Abuse, right? So we don't really have that option to be undercover anymore, you know, in our conversations. But we can design a scientific experiment to assess the safety of an extended state DMT uh, experiment, right, or, or an experience uh, without having to like try to scientifically prove entities or anything like that. I think it's jumping the gun to try to um, prove anything like that. I think maybe it, it'll come out through the process. We'll have a better idea how to measure that from experience. Right. <laughs> um, but you got to remember the DMT spirit molecule, that book was super inspiring. And a lot of like, it was one of my first books um, and a lot of people, it was their first introduction to the psychedelic world for, for whatever reason, the name is catchy. I don't know what it is. Um, uh, but there was very little about the physiology in the book. It's all from his notes. Um, it's all from the, you know, the f phenomenon and him taking good notes of people's experiences that, you know, like that as an experiment, you just have to say, yeah, we're going to take notes, you know, and then we can we can do a lot with those notes later. You know, we can do uh, anthropological studies, you know, really interesting. Like, let's play with the idea that this is real in some way. Uh, what would it look like if we were to study it like another culture or uh, <laughs> you know, mm, yeah. uh, what would we learn about these beings? You know, what types, what kinds of are, are there? You know, are they all the same and just being perceived through different filters or is there a big difference between something that's seen as an alien versus something that's seen as a angel or a, you know, a animal spirit or something like that, you know? Yeah. Do you have any like um, concerns about this at all? Like any, um, I don't know, like risks involved or what, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah. Yeah, there's, I think like with any big adventure, you're going to have some pretty significant risks to look at and manage. And that's, again, why we're wanting to have work with really skilled psychonauts as opposed to just novice, healthy volunteers. Um, you know, so one of the biggest questions for me uh, is, uh, is it psychologically safe uh, to have an extended state DMT experience? Um it's not uncommon for people who are like heavy DMT users to be a little, to come off as a little ungrounded, you know, in their beliefs and in their uh, excitement. There's a lot of excitement, you know, and a real strong belief that it's real. Um, but there's a little bit of a coming off as a little off in, in their uh, orientation and presentation psychologically. You know, there might be a little bit of mental health stuff going on there. Did the medicine cause that or did is it were they predisposed and that's just how they are and they're attracted to the medicine in that way? Mm -hmm. uh, so the question is, is, a, is an extended state DMT experience similar to somebody just overusing DMT? You know, does it does it disrupt their ego boundaries to the point that they're not functional? So. Uh, so that's one question. And, and, you know, and what that might look like is like, uh, like being unable to return from that space, at least to some degree, or feeling overly open to energetic or spiritual energies. You see, you know, like uh, people who sometimes do too much ayahuasca or in an uncontrolled or unsafe space. Uh, it's like they're um, the flow of information. They're unable to turn off the flow of um, inspiring information and it can be overwhelming to them too, you know, too much content. And so in that, uh, psychologically can look like either psychosis or mania specifically. Um, and so I believe though, that we can assess for that before, like the, at least the higher probability that that could happen in certain people, like usually people who are predisposed to that, um, already have, um, things that we can see and, you know, and, and acknowledge, you know, and so there would be a lot of assessment um, uh, tools that we would incorporate into, um, into people being selected by this. And, uh, and Carla Clemens, who is a friend of mine and the, and our principal investigator, she's a Naropa uh, professor and, um, um, 
really, uh, uh, she's an uh, assessment expert. She, she did this, the uh, independent rater assessments for the MDMA study in Boulder, uh, the phase two study. Um, you know, I think we can, I think we can assess for safety around mental health stuff. Um, the other areas that we have concerns around is the, the, the physical and psychological health of the team that, um, it, to, to us, another edge that we really want to promote and push is that to be in congruence, to be congruent with the psychedelic image, you know, like the values that we have is that the medicine work that we do should help us be healthier human beings, not unhealthy human beings. And in any intense research environment, there's a lot of push to um, not take care of yourself. Um, to get the research done or to, or to, to move the movement forward. And, um, and I don't think we have that, uh, um, capacity in a, in a extended state DMT research study. I think it's too big of a process to not take care of ourselves from the beginning. And so we're playing with like, what does it mean to have a healthy team? What does it mean to be healthy ourselves so that we can be most resourced to take care of people in these states? Um, you know, as a sitter or guide in, in an experience like this, everybody in the room is going to feel it to some degree. Everybody's going to be on the journey to some degree. So we need to um, take care of our, our people as much as the participant. Um, and, then, and then the last area that we're really exploring and paying a lot of attention to is that, um, you know, we might face uh, backlash from the mainstream culture. And we might also face backlash from uh, psychedelic researchers and things like uh, you're some, you know, like we're somehow uh, hurting the movement by not talking or by talking about something that's too far outside of the box of mainstream acceptability. Um, and so that's one edge. And then the other edge is there's a either it's either a psychological phenomenon or it could be a spiritual one. I don't I don't know the answer to that, but you can we can speak in psychological terms. And that is we each have a part inside of us that doesn't want to wake up and doesn't want to explore consciousness and spirit. You know, it's like it's a scary process. And uh, sometimes that part that doesn't want to wake up will present itself in the collective field and will challenge us um, and attack us. And we've, we've had these experiences before where we've been like psychologically or uh, ridiculed publicly, um, uh, question our legitimacy to do this work for unusual reasons. And it feels like a, a psychological attack as opposed to like a rational um, uh, critique or something like that. So, so we're trying to figure out a way to um, protect the core community and the team from these energetic kind of disturbances that we've encountered so far. Yeah. I mean, yeah, it does sound like it's kind of on the fringe on the outside of psychedelic research, but I also think it's really fascinating to even want to explore it. Right. Right. Um, just to kind of explore what, what else is out there. And, uh, kind of unravel this this mystery question of what's consciousness i mean whether we can find that through substances like dmt or if we'll ever really figure it out or if it has to be through like neuroimaging i mean i just think it's fascinating to explore that and to come up with a creative research project to you know maybe push the, push the limits a little bit yeah yeah i mean the research itself is fascinating enough just you know just the uh just the act of doing it i think is inspiring enough um, but yeah, these are big questions. And, and, and one of the reasons I, I thought this would be a good conversation to start is that it's really evocative. People have uh, very strong opinions about it, uh, both negative and positive. And I really, I really am inspired by being part of that conversation. It's, an, it's, it's intriguing, it's interesting, and people are deeply affected by even just the idea of it, you know, um, and I think we need that as a community, you know? Yeah. Kyle, you mentioned this idea to me a while ago about like, all right, so let's talk spiritual for a moment because there's, you know, more people believe in God than don't. So uh, 
if DMT somehow separates the body from the soul in in some way, I don't. This is kind of like far out words for me on this show. I don't usually go here on the show, <laughs> but uh, <laughs> so how far could DMT allow the soul to go from the body? Um, could it go, in fact, too far? And can we? bring it back. I, th- I think the cool thing about the research that we're, you, you guys are going to do, Daniel, is that, you know, we can do really slow stages, you know, start at five minutes, go to 10 minutes, whatever. I think that's not too much. Um, but you know, maybe three days in a DMT state and you're, and you're gone, but we don't, we don't know that yet. Mm-hmm. Like, is, is the mind able to come back, um, and interface with a human body again? You know, yeah. so, you know, that, and it's cool that we're going to screen for that. We're going to, you're going to use, um, s- experienced psychonauts first, probably martial artists who want to be in their body or, and, you know, probably other athletes as well, well-rounded folks. Um, I don't know, like, ha- has that thought crossed your mind or like, what, how do you mm-hmm. think about that? Yeah. I mean, it's part of like that, uh, it's part of the, one of the things where we're, we're asked to fully surrender into when these medicine experiences is trusting that we will be okay and that we will return from them no matter how far out we go. And, and it does appear we have a mechanism like, uh, to attach us to our bodies, you know, and again, whether or not we're actually leaving our body or not, right. The experience is we are somewhere else, you know? Um, Yeah. Uh, so we would, like any expedition, there's risk. Um, but like you were saying, we would step into it. Uh, and so the, the first question scientifically is, is the equation that Dr. Gallimore came up with based on Dr. Strassman's data, is it accurate? Um, we don't want to assume that. And so just doing reproducing Rick Strassman's work with the machine as opposed to just a syringe that's a that's a significant step, right? And then if we were to just add five minutes to the DMT experience, that is doubling the psychedelic experience of the DMT state. That's doubling it, right? And and most people experience these spaces as timeless or eternity already. So what does it mean to double that? Um, that's a big question, right? And then uh, and then. And then, and then theoretically, because there's no tolerance to DMT, which, you know, that's another question we're, we're curious about. Is there really no tolerance to DMT or is there just an endpoint, you know, uh, that we can't pass? And, uh, but theoretically, we could extend it for several hours, that peak state. Um, but maybe we don't start with a peak experience that's several hours. Maybe we start with a uh, an experience that's several hours, but it's 25% of the DMT peak, right? Um, maybe there's a, you know, a conversation can happen in these states. Maybe it's more like a psychedelic psychotherapy session at that point. You know, there's a lot you could do, but I think if the conditions are correct, the person's been safely screened and we have the person already has experience of returning, um, that I don't think, there would be much of a chance for somebody to not come back from this. Um, but that's a question, you know, it's a good yeah. question. Uh, people have asked me if I would do it and uh, I've come to the conclusion that, yeah, I would totally, I would totally do it. And uh, I would step into it. I wouldn't do a six hour pure <laughs> date first. I, I would I would want to do that five extra minutes first. Um, you know, um, I, I, uh, that would be too much for me for sure. So, um, so we'll see, you know, the, the biggest, the biggest constraints might be physiology, you know, like, uh, do we want our psychonauts to wear a diaper? Um, mm. how comfortable is a DMT experience after you use the diaper? Like, um, do, do, do people want to actually go through that? Like psych uh, or astronauts, they wear diapers, right? So, uh, there's a precedence for it in these spaces, but you know, maybe it's not that comfortable to be in those states that long. No. Mm-hmm. Um, yeah. Hmm. It's like thinking about like damage to the psyche or soul or, or whatever. Um, 
Yeah, I was just listening to this this podcast about um, like the history of MK Ultra and how uh, you know <laughs> not to not to jump down the you know the, this hole too much, but just thinking about you know if they did use like high amounts of LSD back in the day and thinking about weaponizing it and using these substances in really inhumane ways. Like what was the psychological damage to those participants or like victims of, of, of that error? Um, I guess that's something, I don't know if that's out there. Or... Probably produced a lot of homeless people. Yeah. Yeah. It's traumatizing, you know, like overexposure to psychedelics can be absolutely traumatizing to people. And, uh, um, and, uh, you know, like, so we, you know, we talk about ego, like in dissolving ego, but there's another concept of called ego strength. You know, we all have to have some ego strength to engage the world, to go to work, to get up in the morning, to, you know, put our clothes on, right. Things like that. Um, and that, and that ex- extreme, uh, and unhealthy psychedelic states can damage that capacity to have solid ego strength. Um, so that's my biggest concern. And, and, and again, though, but if we address it, then we assess for it. The more of the question that we're really exploring is what's the potential for this work? What, how can it heal the psyche? That's a big question. Maybe there's, you know, like uh, the psilocybin research is showing significant changes in personality traits. Um, I would expect there to be positive personality trait changes in an extended state DMT uh, experiment. And then maybe <clears throat> there's a creative process that occurs in these states, whether you're being told by an entity or you're figuring something out yourself. Uh, we have an opportunity to perceive problems differently and resolve them, you know, to work through them, understand them, come up with novel solutions to them, all of that. And, and to me, you know, that possibility far exceeds um, the risk of, of injury. And again, we're, you know, like we're, you know, I'm a trained therapist. Carla is a, is a master assessor. Um, and we're not going to be the only people on the team, you know, assessing people. It would, it would be quite a process to be chosen for something like this. Um, you know, uh, because of these questions. Yeah, it would be, uh, it's like, I keep coming up against this idea, um, for whatever reason, I have no idea, but of getting some sort of cruise boat or like some sort of barge in international waters. (laughs) So maybe some anesthesiologist out there is really excited by this episode and you own a large yacht. Um, (laughs) yeah. And yeah, some you know, anesthesia and equipment. Yeah, yeah, right. Yeah, yeah. Uh, I would be happy if we could just get it out of the hospital setting. I think that would be a really important uh, edge to try to push in this research. Put it in a container that is very sacred, um, very quiet. You know, the equipment that we use couldn't beep, you know, Um uh, you know, so like putting it in a safe container, but yeah, like if the FDA doesn't want to do this, then we're going to, we're going to create the protocol. We're going to get everything we need to do it. And if we can't do it here, then we will look for places that we can do it. Um, and I mean, the, the, the political environment right now is so chaotic and so unhinged that we don't know what's going to happen in the next couple of years, the next five years, it could be completely open to this, or it could be uh, completely shut down. And, um, and if it's shut down, that's probably our least DMT research is probably our least concern at that point. So I'm really stepping into, yeah, let's just keep stepping into this, just keep living into it. And, uh, and we'll figure it out as we go, you know? Mm. And, and one of the things, Joe, that you mentioned, the anesthesiologist, you know, so I, I was asking Dr. Strassman about this and he said, oh, you need an anesthesiologist uh, to work the machine. You need an anesthesiolog- anesthesia, anesthesia machine. Uh, well, you know, like that anesthesia machine, that's actually um, something that I didn't understand correctly at first, uh, that there are these big anesthesia machines, you know, in hospital settings, but then there are also these little pumps and, uh, and actually we need to work with these little pumps as opposed to these big anesthesia machines. Um, and that we may not need an anesthesiologist to figure out these pieces or, or to work it, 
um, because these pumps are used in chemotherapy and they're also mm. used in ketamine uh, research. Mm. Um, and so right now I'm working with some people in the Boulder area, talking to them. And, uh, and then there's the ketamine training Institute that just started on California. Um, and so we're exploring ketamine assisted psychotherapy as a bridge for psychedelic research into DMT. Uh, we can buy the pump, use it for ketamine assisted psychotherapy, learn how to use it with ketamine. We can do this legally now and, uh, and then we'll gain the expertise um, and knowledge and experience using the machine with ketamine that we can then translate to DMT research. Um, it's actually way simpler than we first thought it would be. I remember um, having this conversation with you and I don't know, a few weeks into us, like having, having some sort of back and forth on this subject. I ran the idea by my sister who's a veterinarian and uh, she goes, oh, that that machine like for animals is only a couple hundred dollars. I was like, what? Crazy. But, uh, yeah, like I'm looking online right now, I'm seeing stuff for sub Mm $3,000. Um, and I guess really you would just need a nurse, um, to set up the IV. Yeah. You need somebody to stick a needle in somebody's arm and you need somebody to, uh, program the machine. So somebody doesn't get a hyper dose of DMT, you know, like we want to be really (laughs) careful. We want to be really careful about that. Um, and, um, but yeah, yeah, we can learn how to do that pretty easily. Like I, I work with medical doctors here in Boulder now. Uh, we have um, office space available for us to do ketamine work. Uh, and so it might be a, a really um, realistic step to, to DMT research to step into uh, ketamine-assisted psychotherapy. Um, and so that's kind of one of the edges that we're exploring right now. And, and so we're looking at a, like some sort of Kickstarter campaign and, and you know, making uh, the, the goal of the Kickstarter is to, is to buy one of these machines. Um, it would be a symbolic gesture, right? Like, okay, we got the machine to do the research, um, but it would also be immediately useful. We could, we could use it for ketamine work. Um, and that's amazing. Like we weren't talking about ketamine-assisted psychotherapy, you know, um, more than a f- couple of years ago, really, in, in like the larger conversations. And now it's a real big thing, you know. Um, but we could, you know, we, I, have, I, I know multiple um, therapists that could step into that work legally, um, safely, and then we have medical doctors that can prescribe it. So, Yeah, that's fascinating and, and great. I, uh, it's very encouraging, right, to have that many people on the team. Um, yeah, already. there's a ton of nurses I've talked to who just want to be involved or people, uh, we have a, mm-hmm. a, a new, uh, friend of the show, Kwasi Anduse out of Buffalo, New York. He's about to be a nurse practitioner and he's super interested in this work. Mm-hmm. And, um, yeah. you know, I'm, I'm sure you've talked to a number of nurses and doctors mm-hmm. who just want to jump right in. Yeah. More nurses than doctors there. There, you're right. There are a lot of nurses that, and this would be a, uh, a nurse would be some, would be a position that would be a sitter in the room. Um, you know, somebody to, um, provide support to the medical doctor, uh, and also, you know, be a kind presence in putting needles in people's arms and all of that. Um, they would be, um, trained as a sitter as much as the facilitators and the, and the doctor giving the medicine out, you know? Yeah, that's cool. Um, Kyle, with your training um, that you're going through right now, like how, how do you feel your university education is prepping you for this kind of work or would it be at all? Um, I mean, academically, I guess just the uh, learning about the body bot and like body psychotherapy. But, um, you know, I think most of my training in, um, say transpersonal realms would probably be much more applicable and, uh, with working with breath work. Um, and then, you know, any clinical experience is definitely helpful for learning how to, um, sit with people in, you know, extreme states or, or whatever's going on trauma. So, mm. Yeah. Yeah. My, you know, my, I got my master's in 
counseling at Naropa, and it's a very um, uh, mindfulness-based transpersonal program. And, uh, you know, I got, a, I got a lot of really good training there, but I also uh, have learned that we needed to add a lot of um, somatic psychotherapy training to our to our repertoire, you know, as healers, uh, psychedelic facilitators. And, you know, we were just talking about that, like Peter Levine's work and uh, somatic experiencing, how bo- how the body discharges trauma, uh, physically speaking. These would be um, things that would probably show up in the experience. So somebody started to shake or tremble um, in a DMT state, being able to differentiate and understand that that might be a uh, uh, a healing experience as opposed to a um, medical emergency, you know, and to not freak out if somebody starts to shudder or tremble or shake, you know, um, that that might be something we really want to support them in as opposed to, oh, we got to shut down the experiment. They're, they're going in crisis. So their heart would be monitored, of course, and a lot of, a lot of, um, a lot of those physiological uh, signs would be, uh, uh, you know, checked, but um, we would probably do our best to hold the course and, unless there was a major, you know, unsafe physical release or something like that. Um, yeah, yeah. Kyle, you want to join the team, Joe? We got- <laughs> hey, I, I would love to. <laughs> hmm. I heard you have a spot for me in Boulder, so sounds good. I, yeah, uh, come on down, man. <laughs> Yeah, I'm really fascinated. It's going to be a really cool thing to watch play out. Like, obviously, it's not happening in 2017. Like, maybe maybe you'll have the equipment by mid-2018, which would be really cool. I'll start doing some some you know, training with the ketamine stuff because that's available right now. There's doctors all over Colorado doing this ketamine work, and it, that's not yeah. too hard to jump in, and especially if um, the organization that you're forming – has some volunteer time, like the doctor prescribes the medicine and you come in as like a volunteer therapist or something and you're just there trying to level up that experience. Um, yeah. Maybe it's fee-based, maybe not, I don't know. But it's a, it seems so possible to get those skills. Well, people, for, yeah, to, yeah, right. It does, it seems very feasible. And people are, I mean, it's, a, it's, a, it's an industry. Ketamine-assisted healing is an industry and people are used to paying for it. It would just be, like, so we would be more advanced facilitators than most of the medical doctors already doing this work. You know, like most of it's not um, assisted psychotherapy. It's here, I'm going to inject you with ketamine and hopefully that your neurological, there'll be a neurological healing take place, right? So, uh, so we know how to hold space. We know how to really deepen experiences. And then we would have the medical support, you know, to ensure physical safety. Um, but maybe the ketamine assisted, if we do charge for it, the ketamine assisted work pays for the DMT experiment, you know, like we're really like, how do we make this work? So we're not beholden to, uh, donors, uh, and the large numbers of people with all kinds of opinions, you know, like we really need to keep it simple and, and be focused and not have a lot of agendas in the, in the experiment. And so the more self-reliant we can be, the better, you know, and, uh, and right now, all of this is being funded by cannabis-assisted healing work, you know. So we're using other modalities to pay for it. And, uh, and, and with, the, with the gathering that we're going to do, um, you know, uh, creativity, art, and music are going to pay for this. And so these are, these are important threads in, um, of the psychedelic community, uh, and so if we can create an opportunity for the psychedelic community to gather, that's, a, that's right there uh, healing for our community. And then we're going to use the money that we make on those gatherings to fund DMT research. Um, why not, right? Like, Absolutely. <laughs> it's a win-win. And I, yes. I love that you guys are actually charging real money for this next event because it is a real fundraiser. We have to treat things we're taking seriously uh, as, as, you know, real meaningful events. It's just not like pay what you can fundraiser. It's a real fundraiser. And um, yeah, that was a big step for me to do that. It feels risky, right? Like I, I get it. Um, And it it makes sense to maybe try to do a couple smaller ones too, in different cities um, as awareness raising events, also fundraising events uh, at the same time. Um, 
like an obvious next step might be Denver, but um, yeah. <laughs> maybe that's a little too close to home. Yeah, well, not really. I mean, Denver's a, a whole other ecosystem of psychedelics than Boulder is. Um, but yeah, you know, uh, you know, it's costing a lot of money uh, to even put on the event. So we didn't want to just break even. We wanted to make a little money to put into the research. Um, you know, so we, you know, we've got. Uh, should we talk about that now? Do you want to? Absolutely. Talk? Yeah, we're at about in. an hour, so let's kind of talk about what we're doing. All right. Yeah. So uh, December sixteenth. Uh, it's a Saturday night. We're having a, uh, we're calling it psychedelic shine DMT X update and psychedelic society social. And, uh, and it's, uh, $49 for students. It's a very limited, uh, number of tickets are available because it's a small venue, but it's really a wonderful venue. Um, it's 49 for students and 99 for, you know, other people. And then, um, and uh, less than 100 tickets are available and they're starting to really sell. So if anybody's interested, I'd encourage you to um, to buy a ticket. Uh, the information, you can find it at dmtx.org. Um, and then there's also a Facebook page, uh, event page through Medicinal Mindfulness Facebook page. Um, Carla and I are going to give an update on the DMT research. We've talked about some of it here, you know, particularly the ketamine piece, but we're going to talk a little bit more about the um, uh, selection criteria too. Uh, and so we're only going to talk about 30, 45 minutes. And then we have three um, uh, different bands. We have a couple of DJs and then our band, uh, our breathwork band, uh, Nabumbu, uh, is going to play. And they are getting incredibly good at um, orchestrating psychedelic inspired medicine journeys through music. Um, and so they're, they're our headliner. Um, and it's also a cannabis friendly event, uh, which is something that we're another edge we're we're stepping into and acknowledging that uh, cannabis is a legal, recreationally legal psychedelic and is incredibly uh, amazing in social situations and dances and, uh, you know, uh, cannabis assisted um Authentic movement and dance is a big part of our program, you know, so we're really opening up a, hey, this is what the psychedelic society looks like um, in a safe environment, in a contained environment, and we're going to celebrate our community and we're going to promote extended state DMT research. Um, so we're going to have food, music, um, can't bring your own cannabis, cannabis friendly. We're going to have art, uh, a really unusual art installation outside. Uh, and then uh, we'll probably have a fire, like a, a fire circle outside and then a big dance party inside. Um, and uh, December 16th. Uh, and Joe, are, are you coming down for that? Or are you TBD TBD? I really want to, All right. um, I've got a pretty crazy, schedule unfortunately I, well you are gonna miss out <laughs> yeah i feel like that every time you do an event anyway but uh well, we got, i actually uh, just had the opportunity yeah, to oh. see the venue the venue is amazing yeah it's at valley soul sanctuary which is this kind of yoga temple um in a beautiful uh, hexagon shaped space with the stage and uh if we can figure out how to live stream it so joe that's kind of your you know kind of your area if we can figure out how to live stream the event uh, or make it available for everybody who's out of town um, to, you know, at least see the presentations. We'll figure that out, you know, so. Yeah. Um, well, that's awesome. All right, cool. Uh, so dmtx.org, medicinalmindfulness.com.org? Um, dot .org. Dot org. Yeah, dot I think org. both get you there. Yeah. Yeah, I think DMTX redirects to your main site, which is awesome. Um, Cool. Yeah, it's a sub page. Yeah. Yeah. Check it out. It's, it's going to be fun. Um, it's, it's really exciting and inspiring. So yeah, I'm excited. <laughs> All right, Daniel. Well, thanks for your time and can't wait to run into you in the near future. Yeah. I'm looking forward to it too, guys. And, uh, thanks for having me on your show. Um, keep up the really good work and I look forward to the next one. 